we have to say my professional father, Professor Jeff Bell is here, my professional yeah. grandfather, Professor Michael Garfield is here. And if you guys know, you know, looking up to your father and your grandfather is the most important thing. I'm here, presenting in front of them, when I've learned all this stuff from them only. Okay? Uh, but the hope is that we can pass on this tradition to some of you guys as well. There are no very strong prerequisites for this particular class. Quaternions and April Gibra, the discussion would be fairly basic. I do expect you guys to know matrix algebra, how to multiply matrices, how to multiply matrix uh, with a column vector, a row vector, or with size, and that's it. So some of you may have known, not known anything about quaternions, dual quaternions, bine quaternions, or paper algebra. They may be for it comes to you, some of you, I know there are some in the audience who probably do this for a living, and my hope is that even for those guys who know the quaternions, there will be some stuff in here uh, that you can take home and possibly see it as something new. Clifford algebra, I'm not going to go into a full page discussion on paper algebra. I think my professor and Bertusky may be a better person to do that, but I will talk about paper algebra as it relates to quaternions. So in that relation, uh, I'll discuss paper algebra. All right, so first thing is references. So the material that I'm about to present to you, the slides are put together, but basic stuff, the material is actually coming from different sources. Uh, Theoretical Kinematics book by Bhattan Rao, by Professor McCarthy, and there are some books on quaternions from where I've taken some stuff. Uh, Geometry Algebra for Computer Science. Uh, there are quite a few books on Geometry Algebra, another name for Computer Algebra, uh, where you find out more detailed discussion on Computer uh, Algebra. All right, so these are the topics that uh, I plan to cover in this class. So we'll start with the complex numbers. We'll see how we can use them for 2D rotations. We'll talk about algebra proteins, geometry proteins, which are used for the 3D rotations, all part of rigid particle transformation. We will talk about uh, applying spaces, vector spaces, because those are some of the fundamentals that you will hear about in today's set classes or tomorrow's classes. People will talk about applying spaces and they will assume that you know. So let this be the that class where you will learn about applying spaces, why they're important, how we distinguish between points and vectors, and why that distinction is important. Uh, transformations, linear transformation, applying transformation, rigid body transformation, we'll also have predictive transformation, but I'm not going to discuss that. And then we will talk about during kind of quaternions. This, this list of topic may be a little bit suboptimal, the ordering may be a little bit suboptimal, but it makes sense to me, so hopefully I can pass on that sense to you as well. And then finally we'll talk about triple algebra of R2 and R3 and how they relate to quaternion and interpretation of triple uh, algebra and R3 for the quaternion multiplication. Okay, so let's start with the complex numbers. Now, we all grew up learning about number systems. We started with uh, simple numbers like nationals when we were a child. You know, our parents brought us how we count, right? Or our fingers. Those are basically national numbers. There were no zeros, there were no negative numbers. But then we progressed to uh, integers, we progressed to real numbers, and finally, when we got to maybe high school, we started talking about complex numbers, right? When you have imaginary <coughs> solutions to the polynomial equations. And that's how number systems actually arise. So if you have a very simple polynomial like this, you get an integer as a solution. If you have a polynomial like this, you need to bring in rational numbers to find a solution. If you have a polynomial like this, you know the solutions are real, so now we're talking about real numbers. And then finally, when you get to this equation, you say that, well, we need now complex numbers to find a solution to this kind of polynomial, right? Unfortunately, we can't go anything beyond. This is where we have to stop. But we do have numbers which are sort of higher in dimension than complex numbers, but they don't arise naturally from solutions polynomial equations, like quaternions and dual quaternions. So how do they come about? Now, we said that complex numbers can be used for 2D rotation. So what on their representation? There are a couple of very popular but known representations for complex numbers. One is the Cartesian representation, and we use that typically to represent a point, which itself is represented as a vector. So if you choose two basis vectors, let's say one and i, and uh, one is a basis vector over here for this complex plane, so that you can write the court, the representation of the point x and y as 1 times x plus i times y. So x and y are the coefficient and 1 and i are your basis vectors in this complex plane. And the algebra is that i squared is equal to minus 1. 
right? We know this form very well, except that you probably have never written one in front of x. So. But we do that now because we want to see that z is now being represented as a linear combination of vectors. So basic vectors are one and i, and x and y are the coefficient. This is the well-known polar form where we can write z as r times z for i theta, r gives z the magnitude of this vector, and theta gives z the orientation. So you can expand e for i theta using Taylor series expansion, you get this. And again, this matches well with this, because r cosine theta is nothing but the prediction of this vector on, on, on one axis, and r sine theta is prediction on i hat direction. Now, complex numbers, the mathematicians like to call the group, the set of complex numbers, a field, because it has certain properties. <coughs> and you know, some of the properties are very well known to us, because they come from the properties of the real numbers also. So the real numbers are also fields, because if you take two real numbers or two complex numbers, you add them, you multiply them, you get a complex number. So the algebra is complete in that sense. They're associative, so you can take two complex numbers, add them, associate them in any way you want. If you have a product, you can associate them in any way the one that can be same. They're commutative, so z1 times z2 is equal to z2 times z1. Uh, they're distributive, so product distributes through the addition. We have additive multiplicative identities. You have the numbers which you can add or multiply with a complex number and it will keep its original identity. You also have the inverses, except for z equal to z. So complex numbers form a field and so do real numbers. But there are numbers which actually are not free to see them. Then the next question is how do we effect a 2D rotation from a complex number? <coughs> so let's say we have a vector and that's the vector over here being represented by a complex number in polar form. So it has a magnitude, it has an orientation. Now let's consider a unit complex number. A unit complex number would be something that has a unit magnitude, so x direction is square plus y coefficient square equal to 1, and that's the case over here, so this is a unit complex number. But if we multiply w with z, where we think of z as the operator acting on this operator <coughs> w, and the order is not important because we know the complex number is com commute, we get this. Essentially, what this is giving you is a new vector of the same magnitude as, a, as the original one, but it is rotated by an angle alpha. So theta was its original orientation from x-axis, the new orientation is theta plus alpha. So it rotated by an angle alpha. So what this is telling you is that you can use a unit complex number to effect a rotation in a plane. Now, if you want to multiply by a non-unit complex number, you can actually more. So if you have a non-unit complex number which has some magnitude s, and this is the unit part of the complex number, and you multiply this operator with the operand which is r to r i theta, you basically get a new complex number that is also rotating, but it is stretched in length. Right? So essentially you have achieved both scaling as well as rotation via a non-unit complex number. And this kind of transformation is known as a conformal linear transformation because it has a linear representation and it maintains the angles between the vectors and the lines, and that's why it's conformal. <coughs> then we have a well known matrix form for 2D rotation. We have seen that this can be used as a rotation operator in a plane. So if you expand this by multiplication, you get r e for i theta plus alpha, which we just saw. You expand this further, then you can write this whole thing as a basis transformation. And some of you will probably know about this very well. So x and y are the, the coordinates that you want to transform, and that's a two by two matrix. And this happens to be a special orthogonal matrix, because the data part between the rows and nurses uh, is equal to zero, and their magnitude, each of the rows and columns is also one. Couple of examples, so if you take a vector that is pointing along direction one, now x axis, you multiply it by i, which can be written like this. Basically, it rotates it by 90 degrees. If you multiply it by i squared, it made us it in the opposite direction. All right, now, this is good. You can affect a 2D rotation by a unit complex number. Sometime in the middle of the 19th century, a mathematician Hamilton had this idea to extend the complex numbers to affect uh, <coughs> 3 d rotations. So he posited a three-dimensional complex number, but he wasn't very successful with that because the algebra of a three-dimensional hyper-complex number is actually not complete. It's almost as if nature prefers certain dimensions. But he had an idea where he could actually uh, extend 2D complex number to a four-dimensional hyper-complex number, which he called 
alternative was excited by that discovery that you know the carbon from the bridge he was walking on. So quaternions are basically your right for having complex number, and complex numbers are so sort of rank two, while the real systems are usually of rank one. And they're defined as a four tuple. So you have four coefficients over here, q4, q1, q2, q3, and you have four basis vectors. You have one as a basis vector i, j, and k. Now for the complex numbers, you only have this much. Right? We don't have these two, so this is an addition to a regular complex number. Another form of writing this is where we have a scalar, so this is called a scalar, and this it looks like a regular 3D vector, so we call this a vector source. In terms of, not in terms of notation, the bold face letters would be uh, 3D vectors over here, and this is a scalar. Then now to add and multiply two quaternions, we need the algebra of these basis vectors, and the algebra is similar to what we have for the complex numbers. So we have i squared, 14 minus 1, j squared, set 2 minus 1, but also set 2 minus 1, and multiplication of i, j, and k is set 2 minus 1, <coughs> i, j, uh, and he commutes with j, i, so i, j is equal to k, and it's also equal to minus j, i, j, k is equal to i, and it's equal to minus k, j, and same thing. So these, these are the four fundamental identities. These can be obtained from these four fundamental identities. Now, knowing this algebra, we can now multiply two quaternions. So if we take one quaternion, let's say q, which has four tuple, and this is the scalar plus vector form, and write another quaternion, let's say p, and want to multiply these two, we get something like this. So the algebra in this case is complete in the sense that when you multiply these two, you still get a quaternion. You don't get anything else. So you might get a pure scalar quantity, or you might get a pure vector quantity, but in general, you'll have both the terms. And these are the terms that you have. So you will see over here that we have the multiplication of the coefficient of 1, so q4, p4, minus a dot product between the two vectors p dot p. And we know dot product is a scalar quantity, so this is a scalar quantity. Plus, this is a vector quantity that we obtain. And you can see this comes from q4 times p plus p4 times q, plus there's a cross product between q cross p. All right, so <coughs> we're going to see multiplication of questions quite a bit into this class. So what we want to do now is, I want you guys to take out your notebook and actually make sure that you get this. So use this algebra, write these two questions and multiply them. You'll have 16 terms and you should be able to get this. So you guys have five minutes to do this. Take out your notebook. <laughs> because unless you do this math, it will never stick to you. And otherwise I can just stand here and talk about everything and then go home and forget. <laughs> So take out your notebook, your pen or pencil, whatever you have, and uh, make sure that you actually get this. It's a school, not a lecture. Yeah, I might say. Yeah. So this is the typo. 
if you're getting stuck somewhere, feel free to talk to your neighbor and get some help. You're not being graded. Is there any intuition for defining ijk equals minus 1? We'll get to the intuition part, the geometry part, pretty soon. Yeah. All right, okay, I'm going to ask you guys to stop now. The idea was to just to wake you up. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. kidding. It's all right. You know, if you haven't completed it, when you go home, try to work this out yourself uh, and make sure that you do get uh, this expression. Okay, so, okay, just to re emphasize, we have a scalar part, we have a vector. Now, one thing to notice over here is that this uh, product, and I'm just rewriting that product, is that uh, the multiplication of the quaternions <laughs> does not commute. And the sim simple reason behind that is that Q cross P, which is the cross part, is not equal to P cross Q, right? So it's not going to commute. <coughs> if you change the order, the end result is going to be different. It does not even anti commute, so, which means that you can say that Q P is equal to minus P Q, right? So that's the reason. Okay, I don't know why things look kind of uh, <coughs> Strange over here. Okay. Um, Quaternions are not feeds because they don't have a very crucial property, which is that uh, they don't commute. 
Okay, so there are no fields that are called division ring because you can do the division. They have all, all the field properties. One question can encode both scalars and vectors, and this should, should really should be over here. Um, and if you make a scalar part to be zero, you have a 3 d vector, you can represent a 3 d vector also by a return. Okay, where we will also do three dimension space. So if you have two vectors, let's say, you can multiply them now. Until now, you probably learned that you can't multiply two vectors, right? Not in the sense that you can multiply two real numbers or complex numbers. You can do only specialized product operations with them, dark product, cross product. But you, do, you can multiply vectors if you treat them as quaternions where the scalar part is zero. And if you do that, you'll see that this part is going to be zero because there's no scalar part. And these two terms will be zero. So what you'll be left with is just the dark product and the cross product. So what you get is minus beta w plus b cross w. So you have both dark product and cross product built into this. And in fact, the quaternions precede the uh, vectors. They were <coughs> nobody found a great use for them until very recently. <coughs> if we and we are v and w are equal to each other, then we'll have basically v squared. Okay, if the v and w are equal to each other, the v w would be equal to minus v dot v, and that's <coughs> the same as minus minus v squared. If v is perpendicular to w, then this one is going to be zero, and we'll get v w times if is equal to v cross w. Let me see if I can pull up the representation. Switch to my presentation later for a moment. Okay, so now we have a happy complex number, a quaternion. The idea is that if we use that to get the 3D equation. So let's see if we can do that. Let's take a quaternion, Q, and let's take a vector V, right, which is a 3D vector, and try to multiply them to see what we get. So if we multiply Q with V, if Q is a quaternion, V is a 3D vector, this one is going to be zero because the scalar part of V is zero. So we get minus Q dot V, plus a bunch of other terms, which we don't need to pay attention to. The idea is that if you multiply a vector with a quaternion, you should get a vector. If you don't get a vector, then there's a problem. And clearly, the scalar part of Q and Q times V is not equal to zero, which means that QV is actually not in R3, right? And that means that we are part. We can't really get a 3D rotation by simply multiplying a quaternion with a vector. Another way of looking at a quaternion, and this is an aside, is that you have four units over here. We can write these two together. So we have Q41 plus Q1i, and this looks very much like your complex plane, so it's isomorphic to the complex number. And Q2j plus Q3k can be written as Q2 plus Q3i times j. And if you distribute this j through this, you get Q2j plus Q3ij, <coughs> and ij is equal to k. So we do get our original quotient back. These two are themselves complex numbers, which means we can write the quotient also as alpha plus beta j, where alpha and beta are the complex numbers. So we are going to do some definitions now, so let's introduce them. The conjugate of a quotient is defined as the scalar part minus the vector part. So if q is q4 plus q, then q conjugate is q4 minus q. So it basically changes the sign of the vector. If you multiply a quotient with this conjugate, you basically get a sum of the square terms of all the quotient coefficients. So we have q4 squared plus q squared plus p d squared plus q one squared. And of course, multiplication of two quotients should give you a quaternion. In this case, this quaternion happens to have only the scalar part. It doesn't have a vector part, so that part is not there. The norm of a quaternion is defined as square root of q q conjugate, and in this definition, very similar to how you define the norm of a vector. Inverse of a quaternion is defined in such a way that q times the inverse should be equal to 1, and this should commute. So q inverse q, q p inverse, both should be equal to one. So if you start with this identity q, q equals equal to one, you multiply by three multiplied by q conjugate, 
you get the norm squared over here, you divide by that, and you get Q inverse simply as Q conjugate over norm squared. If the norm is equal to one, which means that if this term is equal to one, then this quotient is called a unit quotient. So now we're getting closer to a unit complex number and see how we get a 3D collision from that. If we choose Q4 to, let's say, cosine theta, which we can do, then this term should be equal to sine squared theta, right? And in that case, we can write Q as this. So we have cosine theta times one plus sine theta times a unit fraction. So unit fraction over here belongs to R3. Match of the unit fraction, of course, has to be one. We can also write this using exponential notation. So that is equal to e to the power u hat theta. Again, if you do this relative expansion of this, you'll find that and you get this. Now u hat the squad is going to be equal to one. Why is that? Because u hat is natural u hat is actually one. U hat squad is minus natural u hat squad, and by definition it's in your boundary, so we get u hat squad equal to minus one. So now this is looking very much like your i squad equal to being minus one in the complex plane. Another important identity that we would use is that the norm of part of the two quaternion is equal to the part of the norms. So if you multiply a vector with a quaternion, let's say r is a vector and you have q as a quaternion, then the magnitude of this is going to be equal to the magnitude of r. What this is telling you is that if you multiply a vector with a unit quaternion, the length does not change. Right? And that means that it's a linear isometric. In 40, if it's a 40 number, it's a linear isometric because it keeps the length constant, there's a linear representation for it. And the only, only linear isometry you have in 2D or 4D is a 4D rotation or a 2D rotation. So that means that unit quaternion <coughs> should represent 4D rotations, not the 3D rotations as such. Now, we can talk about the geometric integration. So we know that u hat squared is equal to minus 1. And we also know that 1 is perpendicular to u hat. So basis vector 1 is actually perpendicular to any vector in RT, right? Why? Because the vector part of this is 0. And the scalar part of is zero, which means that if you take the dot part, they're always going to be zero. So one is always perpendicular to any vector in R3. So if u hat is squared to minus one and one is perpendicular to u hat, then we can form a quaternion plane from one and u hat. Right? So we get one and u hat, and since u hat is squared is minus one, and these two are perpendicular to each other, this looks very much like your regular complex plane. A unit vector, a unit quaternion in this plane is basically given by e for u hat theta, right? So if you look at this complex plane, and if you have, let's say, a quaternion in this plane, and you multiply it by this, you will essentially get the same thing that happens in the complex plane, where the vector is rotated by an angle theta, right? And that would happen just in this quaternion plane. That is not the same as 3D rotation, but it's actually a 4D rotation happening just in this type of plane. All right? What about in the other plane? So this is only in the plane of one and u hat. So what about the other plane? Well, we have to have a vector of quaternion in an orthogonal complementary plane of one and u hat. So let's say we have a quaternion which is perpendicular to both one and u hat. Right? It's perpendicular to both one and u hat, so it's not in the plane of one and u hat. And we know that quaternion is an isometry, which means that uh, once you multiply this p <coughs> on the q, it's going to stay in that plane. It's going to rotate in that particular plane only, so it's going to go out of the plane. So let's consider some of these transformations. And we'll only get to the 3D rotation. So let's say we have a left multiplication by a portion in q on p. So this is the operator, that's the operator. So we have q times p. We have a right multiplication, p times q, so portion is on the right hand side. We have a right conjugate multiplication, so we have q conjugate on the right side of the operand P. Let's look at each of these three and see what their geometric interpolation is. So let's first consider our quaternion plane form from one and u hat. All right, and we have a unit quaternion operator, E bar u hat theta, and we have a quaternion P, which is in this plane only. Now remember, a general quaternion is not going to be necessarily in this plane, so there are components of Q in the orthogonal complementary plane of one and u hat. But let's see what happens to the components of the quaternion P in this plane. Now we've already seen that this plane is isomorphic to the complex plane, which means that if we multiply, if we multiply P with Q, it's going to rotate in this plane by an angle E in counterclockwise direction. And the effect is the same if you have Q on the right hand side, because we have commutatively for the complex numbers, uh, 
So whether you multiply q on the left or on the right, p is always going to rotate in the counterclockwise direction. So that's your left multiplication and right multiplication right over here. Let's see what happens with the right conjugate multiplication. So if you multiply p with q conjugate on the right hand side, well, in this case, because q conjugate has, is going to have negative vector terms, is going to rotate around negative e direction or along the clockwise direction. So the two multiplications have different effect in this plan. Now let's consider the other plan, the orthogonal complementary plan, which is one and two hat. Again, our unit function operator is e to the power u hat theta. And now we consider the vector v, which is in this in this plane, perpendicular to one and u hat. So now we're talking about the other complementary of uh, so if we left multiply v with q, and that's the algebra we want to work out over here, q itself is cosine theta plus u hat sine theta, and v is a vector in R3, so we can write it as <coughs> plus v. So if you extract this further, you get cosine theta v plus sine theta times u cross v. Let's look at the right multiplication. If you do the right multiplication, we have v over here and q over here, and now we change the order, so you get a minus sign over here. All right, so this effect is different from what we saw in the thing of one and u hat. If you multiply v with q conjugate, you get the same thing as you get when you do the left multiplication by the quaternion. So this is what is happening in the plane perpendicular to one and u hat. Right, now let's try to put them together and see what happens. So, so graphically, we can see that if you have vector v in the plane of v and u hat cross v, and v, this is the basis, these are the two basis vectors for the perpendicular plane, because v, u hat cross v, repeats that they were, and both of them are perpendicular for each other, so v dot u hat cross v is always going to be zero. So if you left multiply, or you do a right conjugate multiplication, v is rotated in the counterclockwise direction by angle theta, and if you do a right multiplication, v is rotated clockwise by angle theta. So now we know what happens to the vectors, <coughs> the complex of the quaternions, in the two orthogonal complementary plane. Now we can try to put them together. But before we do that, let's look at these four basis vectors and what they are. So we have one, we have u hat, we have v, we have u hat cross v. So the claim is that these four are isomorphic to the quaternion basis. So quaternion basis vectors are one, i, j, and k, and we know that i squared is minus one, j squared is minus one, a squared is minus one. We also know how they multiply with each other. Let's see if we get similar rules for these four basis vectors. U hat squared is minus one, we've already seen that. V squared, if it's a unit vector, is also equal to minus one. And U hat cross V, which is also a vector, is squared is also equal to minus one. So square of each of these three basis vectors is minus one. If you multiply the two vectors, take two at a time, U hat cross V, U hat times V, V times U hat cross V, and U hat cross V times U hat, you should get the other vectors and they should anti compute. And that happens to be true. Which means that one vector corresponds to one, u hat corresponds to i, v corresponds to j, and this term corresponds to k. But this is still doesn't answer the question as to how do we get a 3D rotation. So, so far what we're seeing is we can multiply, left multiply, right multiply, we can right multiply by a cube conjugate, or left multiply by a cube conjugate, and all of those give rise to 4D rotations in hyperplanes. Right? How do we get three rotations out of them? Well, for that, we have to consider a conjugation function, also known as sandwiching function, where we sandwich the P, the operand, with Q on the left and Q conjugate on the right hand side. <coughs> now, we have already seen that the left quantification by Q on P in the one you have twin <coughs> rotates this vector by an angle theta. Right? So you will get a result and let's say P prime, which was over here. And you multiply that p prime with q conjugate, it rotates it back. So in the plane one you have, p is basically left invariant, right? So if this transformation is an identity transformation in the plane of one you have. Nothing happens. This sandwiching function doesn't do anything to vector p at this particular point. Let's look at the orthogonal complementary plane, v u hat cross v. Over here we have seen that if you multiply a vector with, let's say, q on the left hand side, it rotates by an angle theta, and the resultant effect multiplied with the conjugate also rotates by an angle theta in the counterclockwise direction. So essentially, you have gotten now two theta of rotation in this orthogonal complementary plane. Some of you who have dealt with questions have probably heard this that when you do the conjugation function like this, 
the rotation in one of the planets is canceled, the rotation of the planet is double. This is exactly what is happening over here. All right, so this is where you will see geometry as to what is happening. So this kind of function will basically allow you to do 3D rotation now, because this is the rotation happening in this plane, which is perpendicular to the plane of one you have. So if you had, can be made an axis of rotation, and theta by 2 can be the angle on which you can form the quaternion, then this conjugation function should give you a 3D rotation by the angle theta along you have. All right, so let's see that. So uh, we can write the unit quotient in this form, right? That's the, this is the common form. We can also write it using a uh, quarter form. And we want to rotate, let's say, as an example, this unit vector. Uh, we want to rotate i, this unit operand, and you had this your operator by theta equal to pi over 3. Okay, so let's try to do this. This is your hands on exercise now. Uh, we, want to, we want to rotate i about you had by the of theta. So the first step would be to write the unit question in, and then apply the conjugation function. All right, so don't look at the solution, to be honest. I have the solution over here. But just note down the unit structure, note down the theta, and write the unit structure and apply the conjugation function. See what you get. We know that u hat is this, and the q can be written using this expression from that. 
to have that angle with the double sub. So when you plug in theta in the expression for Q, this theta has to be half of this. Okay, now, those of you who have dealt with matrices over their life, for the transformations, for rotation, as well as uh, rich body transformation, probably will be wondering you know, why do we need use for turning. And there are multiple reasons uh, for doing that. From a computational point of view, you need only four numbers to represent the rotation as opposed to nine for a three by three rotation matrix. They are efficient to compose, so in one departure, means you have 16 multiplication as opposed to 27 for three by three matrices. Conjugation function itself takes more motivation to do than uh, matrix multiplication, so that's the sort of downside of quaternions. Then you can easily renormalize them. We need unit quaternions, and they're easy to renormalize because we just divide by the normal square as opposed to matrices. When you multiply matrices, eventually the row vectors and column vectors are no longer orthogonal to each other. That gives us a distortion. So they are harder to deal with than they are with quaternions. Well, if they are not normal, they are not unit quaternions, we can divide them by their magnitude and the unit quaternions. The other advantage is that they can pattern the interpolate very nicely. You'll see that interpolation with quaternions is actually much better than matrices. So, as an example, let's say we want to do interpolation between two spherical spaces. And the two spherical spaces are given to us as two key frames. Okay? So, which means that for each of these two positions, we either have quaternion representing them, or we have a rotation matrix. So let's say this is equal to 0, this is equal to 1, and we have the rotation matrix for each of those two instances. We can do a linear interpolation between those two matrices, and that's fine. But as you can see, that for values of t other than 0 and 1, 
you will get RT, the rotation gauge is a function of time, which is not going to be necessarily orthogonal, mm -hmm. which means that now you have to apply some orthogonalization scheme on it, like Gram Schmidt, to get the matrix to be orthogonal. So if you do interpolation just with the rotation matrices and you don't orthogonalize them, you will see in the motion you will have a degree violation. You can also do linear interpolation of the quaternions, and we have two quaternions, each of them representing a rotation at two ends. And if you do that, basically you get Q as a function of time. So if let's say T is changing uniformly between Q0 and Q1, you will get quaternions that are uniformly spaced. And of course, they are not going to be in it as well, just like rotation matrices won't be. You can project them onto the inner hypersphere to get the unit quaternions. Now, if you do that, we will have a little bit of a problem because you see that the prediction on this inner hypersphere are not going to be uniformly spaced. And when that happens, you will have sort of speeding up and speeding down along this. So how do we resolve that problem? For that, we have something called a spherical linear interpolation that was proposed by a guy called Ken Shubek in 1985, where the coefficients of Q0 and Q1 are now transcendental functions. And they're actually ratio transcendental functions. So they're not linear terms. So we have to do a little bit more computation in getting these. But the advantage is that at any given instant t, the Q is always going to be a unit question here. This is another example uh, of a spherical motion. And in this case, we're trying to design a spherical basin motion. So instead of two quaternions between which we do linear integration, we can have four quaternions. We can design a basic curve. And a basic curve is basically defined in the following fashion. So you have the given quaternions or the points, and you have something called blending functions. In this case, they happen to be constant polynomials that are easy to obtain. And these are approximating curves. So essentially what you're trying to do is designing this curve in the image space of a spectral displacement, in the space of quaternions. So you're designing a basic curve. And then once you do that, you can obtain Q as a function of time. So you plug in the value of T from 0 to 1, you get various values of the Q. You put them back either in the matrix form, if let's say you're trying to you know, draw this using you know, 3D graphics API like OpenGL, then the matrix form is useful. You put them on the stack to show this. Uh, or you can plug them in into the conjugation function and get the question here. So this will show you the basically the motion. Now, if this is a cubic Bayesian curve, the motion that you get in the Cartesian space is actually a degree 6 motion. And the reason behind that is that the conjugation function involves the quadratic terms of the question here. If you look at the matrix, you also have the quadratic terms, which means a degree 3 quaternion curve will translate into a degree 6 twice of that. Uh, motion <laughs> All right, so we've seen how we can do 3D rotation, which is part of the body transformation. All right, but digital body transformation is more than just a rotation. We also have translation in there. So how do we represent rigid body transformation? Can we extend quaternions, which are used to represent 3D rotation, to something more so that we can do rigid body transformation? So what's a rigid body transformation? Well, rigid body transformation is a mapping between affine spaces. So now this slide is where <coughs> you're seeing some new terms coming up, affine spaces. The transformation itself maps vectors to the vectors and points to points, which means that what I'm saying is that I'm making a distinction between the vectors and the points. Right? So what is that distinction? Transformation preserves distances between the points. It preserves the handedness. It preserves the angle. That's what we expect our rigid bodies when they move. We don't want them to stretch or, or uh, contract them. We can write the transformation of rigid body in the following fashion. So we have a 3 by 3 rotation matrix, we have a 3 by 1 column vector, and you have the translation term. So this addition is a translation term. And that tells you that this is not actually a translation in this time. We have already seen that this should be an orthogonal matrix, so that it is the distance. We also want the determinant of R to be plus 1, so you have no reflection. But there are lots of new terms over here, and we need to talk about them, what the points are, and what the vectors are, and how do we differentiate between them. We talk about homogeneous coordinates and introduce that, and a lot of other speakers will also talk about homogeneous coordinates. Uh, affine spaces, <coughs> what are the vector spaces, projective spaces, what are the transformations. So let's get through some of these basics. First thing, distinction between points and vectors. So points are not vectors. Now, until now, probably we have always treated points as vectors, and that's good for representation purposes. But in a lot of areas of kinematics, computer graphics, uh, computer vision, it is important to make a distinction between the points and the vectors. And the reason is very, very simple. One is algebraic. 
If you form an arbitrary linear combination of the points, that operation is not defined. Second problem is that there is no geometric meaning associated with forming arbitrary combination of the points. Okay, so we do have two problems. How do we resolve them? Let's first look at the, the problem itself. So let's say we have a coordinate system and we have two points in the coordinate system. Coordinate two one and one two. We add those two. So P and Q are the two, two points and we add them together. Well, we add them in the, using this, the usual way of adding two vectors and we get a new point. And this vector is at 3, 3, right? So we get that. Now we change this this quarter frame from here to somewhere else. So let's say we just do a simple translation of this frame from here to 2, 0. So the new frame is at 2, 0, transferred along its direction by 2 units. Okay, no movement along y direction. And find out what the quarter of the P and Q are now. Right? So the same points. P and Q in the new quarter frame will have different numbers, right? Because we have chosen a different scale, so for these numbers will be different. So if you move it by to zero, the new numbers for these two points is minus one comma two, and the other one is at zero comma one, right? These are the two points. If we add these two together in this frame, the new point is going to be located here, which is minus one comma three. So minus one plus zero is minus one, two plus one is equal to three. And that's what this point is. The point that we obtained before in the original quadrant frame was right over here. So even without doing any algebra, you can see clearly that there's a problem. These two points are not in the same location. They should be the same location if there was to be a geometric meaning behind addition of the two points. So if you find out what the coordinates of this point are in this translated frame, it's going to be different. In the new frame, the coordinates of P and Q, P plus Q are actually 1, 3 right over here. And these two are not same. So this simple example shows you that if you treat points as vectors and start forming their arbitrary combinations, we will run into problems. So how do we solve that problem? Well, the first thing is, let's find out what kind of operations are valid on the points. We know for the vectors, we can do arbitrary linear combination. We can take a difference. We can multiply them by the scalar. What are the simpler operations on the points? So the only two operations that are valid on a point are that you can add a vector to a point. So if we are given a point P, you can add a vector B to it, and you'll get a new point, which will be given by P, P plus V. Right? So if you think of V as sort of like the displacement or the velocity acting on this point, it translates to a new place. So the other operation that is possible with points is difference of the two points. So if you have point P or point Q, you can take the difference between the two, and that will give you a vector. So those are the only two operations that are actually possible. Which means that now if you have, let's say, a cloud of points, n plus 1 points, uh, there should be n plus 1, p0 to pn, we can choose an arbitrary point, let's say p0, and write this. So what is this? So we choose p0, this could be this is the origin of your, of your quadrant plane, and you can form these vectors, so p1 minus p0, p2 minus p0, pn minus p0. These are all vectors. You can take the difference between the points, and that's one. We can multiply them by coefficients and add them together. That's also okay because this is nothing but, all of these terms are nothing but a linear combination of the vectors, which are valid. And this vector can be added to a point. That's also okay. So all of these operations are actually valid operations on a point cloud. Now, we collect all these like terms. So we have the P0s everywhere. So let's bring P0 on one side and collect all these coefficients. What do we get? We get 1 minus C1, we have minus C1 here minus C2 up to minus Cn, plus C1, P1, C2, P2, up to Cn, Pn. This is what we get. Let's call this coefficient, <coughs> coefficient of P0, as C0. And C, if we add all these coefficients, what we get? Well, you can clearly see that all of these terms will cancel out with these. Right? C minus C1 will cancel out with the plus C1. This will cancel out with this one, and you'll be left with just one. So some of all the coefficients over here comes out to be 1. And this is the only combination that is actually defined. So if you take an arbitrary combination of the points, then the coefficient should add up to 1. And this is known as a barycentric or a defined combination. The points don't live in the vector space. The points themselves define a space which we call the point space. And these kinds of operations are coordinate free and they're geometrically meaningful. Associated with every affine space, you can have a vector space too, because you can take the difference between the points, and you have an associated vector space. Uh, 
as well. So quantum spaces are something bigger than uh, vector spaces. So let's do some examples. Let's ask which of these points are guided combinations. So assume P, Q, and R are point, then P plus Q over 2. Is that a guided combination? Yes? No? Yes. Yes. Because the coefficient is 1 and a half, coefficient is 1 and a half, you add them together, you get 1. Here also, this is okay because this is 1 third, this is 2 third, you add them together, you get 1. No. This is clearly not, right? Because you don't get 1 over here. What about this? The second last. It's okay, right? Because you have 1 third, add it together, you get 1. What about this? That's okay too, right? Because Q minus R will give you a vector, you add a point to it, you're adding a vector to a point, so that's fine. Vector spaces, or linear spaces, I'm sure most of you know, but this is just for completion, is nothing but a set of vectors with well defined operations on them. The only well defined operations are you can multiply a vector with a scalar, and you can add vectors, right? So that's fine. And the algebra is complete and close because if you check two vectors belong to any vector space, you form and later combination of the two, and that will also be within that vector space. Let's talk about geometric transformations. Now we've seen what affine spaces are. We can talk about their associated transformation, which is affine transformation. We can talk about vector spaces, linear spaces, we can talk about linear transformation. And ultimately we want to get to this rigid body transformation and see how we can use having complex numbers to do rigid body transformation as well. So first question is, well, why is transmission important? Because we want to do positioning. In kinematics, we need to do that a lot. Uh, we need to do the modeling as well as for being of the geometric objects. So typically, a transmission will be defined as movement of an object that will be attached to a local moving frame. Initially, this is positioned at the same place where, as where the global frame is. And then under the transmission T, you can move it to a new location. So linear transformation is a mapping in the vector space. So linear transformation is going to map vectors to the vectors. That's what linear transformations do. And it's going to leave the linear combination of the vectors invariant. So if you form a linear combination of the vectors, you apply transformation on that. This can be safely written as C0 times transformation on individual vectors added together. So the coefficients will not change. So instead of applying transformation on this summation, you can do this individually on each vector, and then multiply them by the coefficient and add them together. In the vector form, we can write them as a 3 by 3 matrix if vector is 3 by 1, or we can use a row major notation where we write the vector as a row vector first and then we write the matrix on the right hand side. Some examples of linear transformation. This is a linear transformation as a 2 by 2 matrix, as a rotation, 2D rotation. We can do a scaling. We have these two terms along the diagonal, so you can see x prime would be x times x, y prime would be y times x, y. A fine transformation. And this is something related to the fine spaces, is bigger than the linear transformation because it can map vectors to the vectors and points to the points. So we don't have we make a distinction between the two, and it can handle both of them. A fine combination is going to be invariant under G. That's how we define that fine transformation. So which means that if you form a linear combination of the points, we do require for this to be meaningful where C sigma C I should be one, the coefficient should add to one then transmission on that will distribute. And that will be equal to C0 times transmission on individual points added together. So all of these coefficients will still add up to 1. In the matrix form, we can write the fine transformation in the following rotation. So this is the same as your linear transformation, T by 3 matrix, T by 1, column vector. And then we add a T by 1 translation vector to that. So now you can see that we can actually represent translation. We can bring translation in, which we couldn't do with the linear transformation because this, this, the, the transformation is not a linear transformation. At the same time, we can combine the 3 by 3 matrix as well as 3 by 1 vector into one 4 by 4 matrix, and this is known as a homogeneous matrix. We just have to add one coordinate to this 3D vector, okay? and we will talk about as to how it is actually done. All right, a few examples of a fine transformation. So you can see that over here, this is now a homogeneous form of matrix, 3 by 3. That's the 2 by 2 matrix over here. And there are no translation terms, so this is 0, 0. So in one single matrix, we can combine the rotation as well as translation, in which case, this will reduce to a digit body transformation in a point. We can do 2D scaling, SX and SY, same thing as we saw before. We can do 2D shear, 
we can have uh, the other terms over here as one. This is the non-zero term. So x prime would be x plus dy, and y prime would be the same as y. So there's no shear no y region, but there's shear in the x region. We can do translation. So for translation, we will make our upper two by two matrix as a identity matrix, and these are the translation terms, T x and T y. And you can see that x prime now would be equal to one times x, x plus zero T x. So x prime is x plus T x, y prime is y plus T y. So all the points on the body are translated by one x and y. If you want to do rotation about arbitrary point, we have to do a composition of transformations. So let's say we have this rigid body, we want to do a rotation about this particular point. We know the rotation matrix for rotating something about the origin. So what we do first is we translate it to the origin, and that is done over here. So assuming that we are going to modify this with a column vector on the right-hand side. So we look at this transformation first, which so this is the one that we applied first on the column vector. So we translate this object to the origin. Then we do a rotation, and that's being presented over here. And then finally, when we are done, we translate it back to the origin position, and that's the translation to point x and y. And you multiply these three, and you get a three by three matrix, which is basically a, a point transformation. All right, so this is a slide that I'm repeating, because this is where we sort of uh, segue into looking at the fundamentals of a point space and vector space and transformation. So the digital body transformation, we're back to that. Now, we already answered the question about the difference between the vectors and the points. We talk about what point spaces are and how we can now incorporate translation into a point transformation. It's a summary. Data transformation represented by three by three matrices. We can do rotation, we can do scaling and shear. We want to do translation. We can do it with a three by three matrix plus a three D vector or a four by four margins matrix, which is called a point transformation. For rigid body transformation, which is a special case of a point transformation, we will ensure that this three by three matrix is a Special optimal matrix and 3D vector itself will be translation vector. Another fundamental that uh, you need to know for this summer school is the homogeneous coordinates. Now, homogeneous coordinates are actually very important. They are the coordinates that are used a lot in computer graphics and computer vision, as well as in kinematics. And some of the basic reasons are that you want to bring it to the forward competition. The competition should be simple, the algorithm should be robust. For example, if somebody asks you, as your advisor, uh, to write a code for computing the of two parallel lines. Well, you know the parallel lines don't intersect, right, in the usual space. But they don't actually intersect at infinity. It's just that you have to handle that. So if you have two parallel lines, you're given the coefficients of the lines, and you write an algorithm to compute the intersection, most likely if you don't deal with the special cases, it'll fail, right? You know, not a number of those kinds of errors will, will pop up on your screen. But using the homogeneous points, you can actually deal with them. So the points that are infinity can be brought into the polar competition in a nice and different fashion. So that allows for you know, far more robust competition without requiring special cases. You can linearize a fine transformation. We have already seen that. So a 3 by 3 matrix plus 3 by 1 translation vector can be put together in one single 4 by 4 conscious matrix, and we can linearize a fine transformation. And we need that for perspective prediction, something that graphics folks have to deal with a lot. Okay, so how do we get homogeneous coordinates? You start with a fine point. So this is an n-dimensional vector. Okay, so this is a column vector because we put the transpose over here. First thing we do is we add one dimension to it. If you want to get to the homogeneous coordinates. So we keep all these terms, all these components, and then we add one to get the way in. So essentially, if this is an n-dimensional point, this goes into Rn plus 1. Right, that's what happens. Then the idea is that we can scale this by any scaling factor. So we can multiply by lambda with each of these terms. And this is not going to change anything. So both of these are actually equal to each other. They form an equivalence class in particular space. So the geometric interpretation of this is that if you have, let's say, a point P in the n-dimensional space given by these coordinates, it's right over here. You add one to it, you basically introduce a hyperplane. Okay, because you introduce one more dimension, so let's say W corresponds to this last dimension. So P is now on this type of plane, which is W equal to 1, right over here. When you multiply by a scale, essentially, you are traversing this line. So if W is positive, you're going to go away from the origin. If W, if the lambda, sorry, is negative, positive, you're going to go away from the origin. If lambda is negative, you're going to go to the direction. If lambda is 1, you're going to 
So all of these points on this ray, on this line, basically map to the same point when you predict them. So if you divide by lambda, which is a common scaling factor, you retrieve the original final coordinates. Okay? But the advantage is that once you introduce this additional scaling factor, you can do a lot of wonderful stuff. So for the R3, let's consider a point in R3, x, y, z. We can turn this into the homogeneous quadrant by adding 1 at the very end, multiplied by a scalar factor. And let's say the new quadrants we get are p to 1, p to 3. If you want to get your final quadrants back, you can divide by the scaling factor. Why about the scaling factor? You retrieve your point coordinates. Okay, now how do we use that for rigid body transformation? Because so this is what we want to get to. So you can put together now a 4 by 4 homogeneous matrix. Your points or the vectors are now going to be homogeneous points. So we're going to add 1 as the final dimension. So this is the point in the moving frame or the moving object. This is the point in the, with respect to the fixed quarter frame. So if you have a moving frame, you have a fixed frame, we can say where this moving frame is in different ways. One is that we can say this is the translation vector, that gives you the origin, as well as the rotation of this. So the rotation of the moving frame, which is a fixed frame, can be given by a T by T rotation matrix, and D gives you the translation. Okay. And this is uh, telling you something about how we can get these two parameters, something I won't get into uh, in this class. But the idea is that you can compose a 4 by 4 homogeneous matrix, which has a rotational matrix, has a translation vector to effective energy body transformation. Now the question is, how can we extend this so that we can use quaternion or dual quaternions to represent a spatial transformation or spatial displacement, just as we could do 3D rotation with the quaternions. Now for that, we need to introduce eight dimensional numbers. Now there is a bit of uh, redundancy over here. Right? Because we know there are only six parameters that are required for a spatial displacement. Right? We don't need more than six. So there is some redundancy. As we had for the quaternions, we have four numbers, but we actually need only three numbers to describe a three rotation. We are going to use something called dual quaternion to actually represent a spatial displacement. What does it look like? Let's look at the algebra first. So Q hat is used to denote a dual quaternion over here, has two chunks. Q plus epsilon Q0. This is called the real part of the quaternion. This is called the dual part of the quaternion. Epsilon is a dual unit. And the algebra over here is that epsilon is quite equal to 0. Q represents your rotation. So if you have a rigid body transformation, you know the rotation axis. You know the angular rotation. You can write this question. We have done this before. So cosine theta by 2, where theta is angular rotation. Sx, Sy, and Sz are the components of a unit fraction of rotation and sine theta by 2 comes out common coordinates. So this is coming from what we already discussed. Let's look at this dual part, Q0, because this is where we're going to have information about translation. Q0 itself is written as 1 half times D times Q. Now, D is your translation vector, but it is written in a quaternion form, which means the scalar part is going to be 0. So this is still a quaternion, and this is your quaternion representing rotation. So this is a unit quaternion. We know that q dot q should be equal to 1, right? So that is taking some redundancy away. We have eight numbers. We got one equation that relates them. So we're down to seven now. All right. We have already seen that we have a 4 by 4 homogeneous matrix that represents a spatial displacement. What's this corresponding representation using quaternion? This part we have already seen. This gives you the 3D rotation. Right, Q, P, Q conjugate gives you the 3D rotation. Which means that this term should really represent the translation vector itself. Now this translation vector is given by Q0, which is the dual part of the quaternion times Q conjugate minus multiplication of these two terms. And again, we can write their matrix form. So this we've already seen, the rotation matrix written in terms of quaternion parameters. And we can also get the D from that because we have this equation, so we can get the D from that. Now, at this point, your exercise is to actually verify that this is the translation vector. So, start over here, right? This Q0 equal to 1 half dq. Substitute that in this expression. We already know what Q is. And see if you can get the d itself from 
Yes, is it too much to ask for? I'm sure it is. But you still have to do it. So, start here, right? Q0.1 half dq. That's the dual part of the quaternion. And then substitute that Q0 in here, right over here. 
guys, you guys should stop now. I know probably I'm going to give you guys enough time to do this. But the idea is that next time you see it won't be so far. Because if you have started working also with these matters. So. Okay, so just to recap, if we know a unit fracture of rotation, we know the angular rotation, we can form the Q from that. From that, we can also get the rotation matrix. If we know the translation vector, we can also get from that the R term, the Q0 term, and plug it in here and get this matrix. So you can easily go from here to here or from here to here. Now, I'm not giving you the formula for going from here to here, but going from here to here, of course. So you have all the formulas right over here. Okay, now we talked about 3D rotation, we talked about spatial displacement, which are presented as part of the quaternion. The next thing is talk about the spatial case of the spatial displacement, which is planar displacement. Now, planar displacement requires three numbers, 0%, right? If you have a moving body, which is with a fixed frame, you can locate its origin, you can locate its uh, orientation, and those are the three numbers you need D1, D2 for translation, and alpha for the rotation. Now again, we are going to introduce some radar density as we've been doing other uh, hypercomplex numbers. And we will form something called a planar quaternion, which will also have four terms, z1, z2, z3, and z4. And we will have over here the basis vectors as i epsilon, z, j epsilon, and k and 1. Okay, where epsilon is the same thing as what we did before, where epsilon is squared was equal to 0, and i squared is minus 1, j squared is minus 1, k squared is minus 1. So that's the rule for the algebra. Now, this is actually nothing new. Even if you don't remember this, you can easily opt in this from the dual quotient representation. Because a planar displacement is nothing but a rotation. If this is a displacement happening in our x, y plane, it's basically a rotation about z axis. Right? So we know that's the rotation. We know the angular rotation. We know the translation vector. So all you have to do is go back to this expression over here, form the cube. So the Q is basically this. We know the angle is alpha, so this will be cosine alpha by 2. We know the axis of rotation is 0, 0, 1. So this will be 0, this will be 0, this is 1. So the terms will be cosine theta by 2, comma 0, comma 0, comma 1. That will be a Q. And Q0 would be 1 half D, which is a translation vector, where the scalar part would be 0, times the Q. So you multiply these two, you get the Q0. And you add them together. That's what you will get over here. So you'll have terms like i epsilon, j epsilon, and k and 1. And these are called the units of the planar quaternion. Now, how are these parameters in terms of d1 and d2? Well, if you do that expansion, this is what you will get. So z1 is given by this, a function of d1 and alpha. z2 is given by this. And z2 and z4 are given by those two terms. And this is known as kinematic mapping of planar displacement. So again, you have the homogeneous quadrant concept. Uh, these quadrants can be treated as homogeneous quadrants, uh, which means you can treat them as a point in a particular space of in a displacement. Matrix form, so if you have a point X and a plane, you, you write in form of homogeneous quadrants, you add one, you have a point, and it is a fixed frame, x, y, one, the planar transmission matrices is given by this. So again, it's kind of a in terms of D1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. Nothing new here. If you know how to do spatial displacement, you know how to do this as well. As an application, we can do Bayesian least prime motion design for uh, spatial displacement. So, so if we are given less a set of displacements, so each represented by a dual quaternion, we can form a Bayesian curve in the image space of a spatial displacement in the quadric fashion, like we did for the spherical displacement. These are positive polynomials. You'll get q hat as a function of time. You substitute into either matrix representation or in the uh, quaternion function, and you get the representation uh, as a function of time there. And once again, if the curve is of degree n, the motion itself will be of degree 2n. And if you have a rational motion, this will be often as a ratio of 2 pi on the function. If you want to design a least point curve, you can do that too. You just have to change your bracket function. So the idea is that once you treat these quaternions and dual quaternions as a point, in the image space, we can apply computer aided jump to design algorithms in that space and transform them back into the partition space uh, to get various kinds of motions. So. All right, so this brings me to the last topic of this class, which is the different algebra and how they relate to the quaternions. So you will see that some of the things that we have done so far will emerge as a special case for the different algebra. 
we talk about the complex numbers, we see that they allow us to represent three rotations. We have uh, talked about quaternions, they allow us to do four D rotation and while computation function, we can also do uh, three D rotation. So essentially we're doing multiplication in those vector spaces. But the problem is that either the four dimensional, you don't have those kinds of product operations. We are specifically looking for some of the rules that we are very familiar with for the space of complex numbers as well as the quaternions like associativity, distributivity through addition, uh, combination of inversal, and that's where the preferred algebra comes in. It tries to fill that gap that exists in the algebra of higher dimension. So we're looking for the rules. We're looking for the LCMs where we can, we can get the rules to get newer kinds of numbers. So for each n dimensional vector space, you can get a preferred algebra of dimension 2 power n. Why is it 2 power n? Well, the reason is that from the basis vectors of the n-dimensional vector space, you can form the parts and sums of the basis vectors. And you can get up to 2 part n of those. And we'll talk about why that is. So if you have, let's say, if you pick zero vectors, you get nc zero numbers. But if you pick one basis vector at a time, you get nc one. If you pick two, you get nc two. You add them together to nc n, you basically get 2 part n from that. For R2, the preferred algebra would be four dimensional, two power two. For R3, the preferred algebra would be eight dimensional. So the basis vectors for R2 in the preferred algebra would be four. The basis vectors in for R3 in the preferred algebra would be eight. And we'll see what those are. The good news is that the multiplication in this algebra is associative. It's distributive. Uh, but inverses don't exist for every non zero factor, something that we would have liked to get, just as we had for complex numbers and quaternions. Okay, so let's look at for R. Now for R n, we have the dimension of the preferred algebra as two part n. If e1 to e n is an orthonormal basis for R n, then we can get k vectors from that. So zero vector, there will be only one, that's one. You have individual basis vectors, which are called one vectors, or just the vectors from e1 to e n. You can pick two at a time and form their product without <coughs> their order. Uh, as long as the conditions are unique, e1, d2, e2, e3, e3, e4, up to these, so you'll have those. So again, this is nc2 number of y vectors. You can have k vectors where you have k uh, bases over here multiplied together, and you can have all of them multiplied together, and that we will call a pseudo scalar. The reason why we call it a pseudo scalar will be clear pretty soon, but they behave more or less like the radial scalars, which are zero vectors. So if we add all of these, you get basically two power n uh, basis here. Now, the algebra for this two power n dimensional vector space has certain rules, has certain properties. So some of the properties that you get from this is that multiplication is associative. It distributes through the addition. One is the identity form multiplication. And for each of the basis vectors in Rn, the square of that can be either plus one or minus one. We will pick minus one because we want to be consistent with how we are dealt with quaternions. So you can pick plus one and piece size different geometries as such. You can also take the product of two basis vectors and they will empty compute as long as j is not equal to y. So as an example, let's talk about the preferred algebra for R1. Now R1 is one dimensional, so the preferred algebra would be two dimensional that, right? Two power one. What are the basis vectors? We need two basis vectors. One is of course the scalar, the other is the sole basis vector. Right? And the rule is that e1 is y is minus 1. Now, you can see that this is isomorphic to the complex numbers. So this is what we saw. So preferred algebra for R is actually isomorphic to the complex numbers. What about for R2? For R2, we have four dimensional preferred algebra. What are the basis vectors? We have 1, we have e1, e2, and we have the power of the 2. Right? e1 and e2, e1 times e2. What are the rules? e1 squared is minus 1, e2 squared is minus 1. And even 2, e1 times e2 should be equal to minus e2 e1. Right? If we set e1 to be i, if we set e2 to be j, and e1 e2 to be k, essentially we get the same rules that we had for the quaternion basis. Right? We get exactly the same rules. So, which means that the preferred algebra for R2 is isomorphic to the quaternion modification. But we're not going to use this for the quaternion modification. We will actually reserve the preferred algebra for R2 to model the rotations in 2D. And the idea is that you want to match the dimension of the physical space of transformation with the dimension of the preferred algebra. Okay, so we will actually use the subalgebra of R3, which is three dimensional space where we want to effect 3D rotations. 
and we will use this for modern rotations in the Let's talk about different things for R3. For R3, we have E dimensions. Basic structures are 1, E1, E2, E3, E1 times E2, E2 times E3, E2 times E1, and finally, E1 into E3, which we call a single scalar. So what are the rules? We know that E1 squared is minus 1, E2 squared and E3 squared are also minus 1, and the product of the two basic vectors can be commute, right? We have that. What about the series scalar, E1, E2, E3? Well, if we square that, we get actually plus 1. So if you multiply E1, E2, E3 with itself, and you redistribute them by using these anti-commutative rules, you will actually get plus 1. Right there is your hint that it behaves more like a scalar. Because 1 is squared is equal to 1. Right? Now, if we pick bi vectors, E1, E2 to be i, E2, E3 to be j, and E3, E1 to be k, well, the square of these is also equal to minus 1. And if you multiply i with j, you get k, you multiply j with k, you get i, you multiply k with i, you get j. And these are the same rules that you had for the quaternion basis multiplication. Right? So this is showing you that if you pick a few basis vectors, from this full range of basic vectors that are available to you in the preferred algebra for R3, you basically get isomorphism with the quotient modification. Right? So what are the kinds of vectors you pick? You basically pick even grade vectors over here. This is an even grade vector, so there are two over here, and this is an even grade vector. We didn't pick even ATV3, we didn't pick the service data as such. So a subalgebra of R3 is now isomorphic to the quotient modification. Now, I said before that we will reserve the Gifford algebra of R2 to affect 2D relations. So let's see how we do that in 2D. So again, for R2, the Gifford algebra division is 4. The basic vectors are 1, E1, E2, and E1 times E2. We know that E1 is squared is minus 1, E2 is squared is minus 1, and E is anti right? So, so we'll pick the sole basis vector, the pi vector over here, and we'll call it a unit called pi. And I'm going to capitalize to differentiate it from the iota we have for the complex number, but they're both equivalent. If you take the i squared, that is e multiplied e1 e2 with itself, you get minus 1. Which means that now you can pick the basic vector 1 over here and e1 e2, which is i, and that would be isomorphic to the complex number. So as we saw for the R3, if you pick a subalgebra of R3 with the even grade basis vectors, we get quaternion multiplication. If we pick the even grade vectors for R2, we get complex number multiplication. Right? So that's what we get over here. So if E1 and E2 represent the unit vectors, that's the normal of vibration, which we can do, that need to be transformed by the complex number 1 and I, we can do that. How do we do it? So this is your complex plane. Right? This is 1 and I. So I is the bi vector E1, E2. This is your real plane. So now we are essentially what we're doing is we are splitting the Clifford algebra of R2 in two spaces. One is the space where we have basic vector 1 and i. The other is where we have e1 and e2. So there are only four of those. So we have a complex plane and we have a real plane. Now, any element in the real plane will serve as an operand for the operator that's in the complex plane. And this is very different from how we do the complex multiplication, what we saw in the very first, first few slides into this class where our vectors were also represented by complex numbers, and our operator was also represented by complex number. Here, what we are doing is, we have this nice separation between the vectors, which would belong to the real plane, and the vectors that belong to the complex plane. Vectors that belong to the real plane can be represented as, let's say, x times e minus y times e2, and also write them in the quarter form. And this would be the vector that we would try to transform or rotate. And the complex number would be cosine plus, pi plus i sine pi, and clearly this is a vector that lies in the complex plane. Now, if you multiply, let's say, z with u, and we are, here we are doing left multiplication, and here we are doing the right multiplication. If you do the left multiplication, basically you get this. And what you're seeing is the transformed vector, so the u prime, so the u that has been transformed in the real plane, is now rotated by an angle phi. So the original was r cosine theta e1 plus r sine theta e2. It has been rotated by an angle phi in the counterclockwise position. If you multiply z on the right-hand side of u, you get a clockwise rotation. This is the negative sign over here. And that's different from how we did things with the complex numbers. The complex numbers did not which side you multiply it by. You always got a counterclockwise rotation. So clearly you can see that 
by splitting open the clitoral algebra of R2 in two different planes, you can achieve more. And you can have this nice uh, distinction between the real and the plane. Just a graphical representation. So if you have a unit reflection U in the real plane of E1 and E2, you, you left multiply on clockwise rotation, you right multiply a clockwise rotation. Right? So we, we achieve something nice, but it's coming at a cost, right? You have you're dealing with now four dimensional algebra instead of doing things uh, in a two-dimensional complex plane. Right. Now let's go back to the R3. So we want to talk about the preferred algebra for R3. We've seen that we can pick the even grade vectors in the preferred algebra of R3, and from that we can get the rules for quotient multiplication. And these are the rules. And the pseudo scalar itself is equal to one. Now there are a few more mathematical details that we need to go through before we can see the connection between the preferred algebra for R3 and the quaternion multiplication, special multiplication function. So we want to introduce a bunch of cross product of two vectors, u and v. So let's say we have a vector u, and you can see that this is only using the e1, e2, e3 as a basis vector, and v, which is this, and this maps nicely to a vector that lives in a three-dimensional vector space. If you multiply these two and apply these rules, this is what you get. So you have here e1, v1, plus v2, v2, plus v3, v3, which is nothing but really a dark part of two vectors. And here you have these terms, which are basically coefficients of, you have the coefficients of the bi vectors in here, e1, e2, e2, e3, and e3, e1. We will collect all these three terms, all these except for the first one, which is clearly a scalar quantity, and define it as a wedge product between e and v. There's a relationship between the wedge product and the cross product, and some of you uh, have probably already noticed that these terms that you have over here, which are the coefficient of the, of the bi vectors, are the same terms that you get when you do a cross product of two vectors. Right? So this defines a wedge product between vector u and v, and this represents a, an area, actually, in the plane of uh, u and v. So if you're thinking about geometric interpretation of uh, even combination of these bi vectors, it basically represents a plane in the vectors of u and v. Then if you write the u times v in a sort of compact form, you, this is the dark part, so you get minus v dot v plus u wedge v. And again, you can see that when we multiply two vectors using the quaternion rotation, we had something similar. We had minus dark part plus the cross product only. The only difference is that we have a wedge product here, not a cross product here. Also, we know that e1, e2, e3 are perpendicular to each other, which means that e1 times e2 would be e1 wedge e2, why? Because the dark of e1 and e2 is zero, and the same thing you get for the other uh, y vectors. We also know that the cross product of u and v is given by this. Right? So you have the same sum that you had for the wedge product, except that instead of the y vectors, you have e1 cross e2, you have e2 cross e3, and e3 cross e1. And these themselves are still simplified to e3, e1, and e2. So the wedge product has the same sums, but the y vectors as the basis. But the cross product has the same term, but the basis vectors of R3 over here, right? So there's a slight difference between the two. But we'll see that there's an operator called duality operator that allows you to go from wedge product to cross product. Now, this hasn't received much attention so far. We talk about the scalar, we talk about the unit basis vectors, we talk about the y vectors. This is the guy who has not been touched on so far, right? So let's look at this. So pseudo scalar will define O as negative of e1, e2, e3. The reason why we call it negative will be you know, clear pretty soon. So O is equal to minus e1, e2, e3. And O, fortunately, because it behaves like a scalar, commutes with all the unit vectors as well as the y vector. So O e1 is equal to e1 O, which is a property that you don't get for, for always. So it's nice to have that. And if you multiply minus e1, e2, e3 with e1, you actually get e2, e3. So using this operator, a pseudo scalar operator, you can transform E1 into E2, E3, which is a y vector. So a rank one vector turns into a rank two vector over here. O E2 is E2O, and that's equal to E3, E1, and the same thing you get for the third. If you multiply O with a y vector, you actually get E1, E3. So O E1, E2 commutes with E1, E2, so we get that, and then that gives you the E3. O E2 E3 commutes with E2 E3 O, and that is E1, and the same thing we have over here. 
So what this is telling you is that if you apply this duality operator on the pledge product, you'll get the cross product. Why? Because if you apply O on this, well, you'll have OE3 get OE1 and OE2, and these will be transformed into the bifactor. If you apply duality operator on these, you will get the rank one factor. So O of E1, E2 would be E3. So we can go from the wedge product to the cross product by using the duality operator. So we say that the wedge product and the cross products are now dual to each other. So O behaves like a scalar. It's not exactly a scalar, but it behaves like a scalar because it comes with any vector actually. So O times P is equal to P times O. And if you square O, you get one, which we've seen before. So what we say is that for any P, O is actually dual of P. O is <coughs> dual to one, which is a scalar vector. And if you apply O on itself, you basically get the one, right? So there's a nice parallel uh, going on over here. So just to summarize, why vectors are dual to the vectors? Because of this duality operator. One is dual to the pseudo scalar, square of both of them is plus one, and wedge and cross cross are dual to each other. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the y vectors because y vectors look kind of strange, right? They have you know, multiplication of two basis vectors. If you have a given y vector, you can always find a pair of u and v such that v is equal to u and v. So it's possible. The plane defined by the u and v is given to be unique, which means v is represented uniquely, where of course the choice of u and v may not be. You can pick another pair of u and v, but you get the same plane, you get the same uh, y vectors. The norm of the v is defined as the norm of the best product. Okay, and that is nothing but the area defined by the UV vector in that plane, and that is the same as the norm of U cross V, because the norm only depends on the components. The components are the same in the best product with the cross product. We can also show that if you multiply a vector with itself using the Clifford algebra rules, you get minus of magnitude squared. And the same thing is true actually for the y vector sources. So V squared is equal to minus norm of V squared. Now, if I said that basis vector, B, the y vector b is 1, that magnitude is 1, then you will get b squared to minus 1. And that is also, again, very similar to the rules we, we saw before, like i squared being minus 1, j squared being minus 1. Okay, let's get back to question to see the connection. So we define i to be e1, e2, j to be e2, e3, and k to be e3, e1, and we got these rules. Right? We've already seen that the, if we pick the basis vectors of rank 2, the even rate, you will get the Clifford algebra of R3, which is uh, identical to the Quartier algebra. There's only one difference that we have y vectors as a basis. Let's see the vectors, right? You have the y vectors, so it's, <coughs> so it's not exactly the same as what we saw before. So if you use the Clifford algebra for R3, you can write a quaternion in this fashion, where this is, a, is this is a scalar quantity and VQ is a y vector. So that's what we get. We need to define some identities, just like we did for, before for the quaternions. The conjugate of Q will be defined as NQ minus VQ. So we change the sign of the y vector. We multiply Q with this conjugate. You get this term, which is same as this, because VQ squared is the negative of norm of VQ squared. We add this together, you basically get norm of Q squared. Right? So all the components squared and added together. We can also define the inverse from that. Right From here, you pre-multiply by Q inverse. And you get this. And this is all looking very similar to what we've already done before. If you want to define a unit quaternion, you have to make sure that the magnitude of Q is actually 1. One way to do that is do the same thing that we did before for unit quaternion. We pick our coefficient to be cosine and sine of some angle. And over here, instead of a unit vector that we have, we'll have a unit y vector. So now magnitude of V prime is actually 1. The other identities that we seen before Gallagher are Gallagher here as well. So if you take the conjugate of part of two vectors, you get Q conjugate, P conjugate, and the magnitude of the product is equal to the product of magnitudes. Now, Clifford algebra of R3 is eight-dimensional. Just as we were able to split open the Clifford algebra of R2 in two spaces, we would like to do the same thing. So we have an R8 space, we will spread it into two 4D spaces. The so one would be where we'll pick the even grade basis vectors of preferred of R3. The other would be where we'll pick the odd elements. Now, this one is isomorphic to the quaternion. So we'll represent it by H, and then we have the dual to H. So we'll call this H times O, 
because if you take any basis vector in the even grid algebra of R3 and you apply the duality operator, you basically get the R3 value. So H we have seen, it provides a natural setting to represent the quaternion. What about H though? Okay, so just as we were able to define uh, a point by the homogeneous coordinate, we can also define a point in this space. We're looking at this space. This space we already know is quaternion space. This space as a vector like this. Now, notice over here that we pick the pseudo scalar as one of the basis vector, and we pick V, which is a vector in the 3D space. So essentially, we have now covered all the basis vectors that you find in the triple of R3. Right? We have all the even grade vectors here, and in HO, we have all the all grade vectors. All right? And we are always defined as minus two and two. The idea is again that we want to create the distinction between the operators and the operand, like we were able to do with the different algebra of R2. We had a complex plane, which served as the operator. We had the real plane, which served as a plane where we would pick our operands from. We would like to do the same over here. So the first question is, how do we multiply a point with a unit quaternion? Well, first of all, we have to talk about the point. Now, where is that point? The point itself is in the HO space, the dual to the quaternion space. So that space is a four-dimensional space. We will split that into two mutually orthogonal planes. So the R4 will be again split into two planes. One would be the plane that would be parallel to the y vector B. Another one would be compared to the y vector B itself. So you are given a y vector B, and you're trying to now, with respect to that y vector, split the plane into two orthogonal complementary planes. And we want to multiply a point with the unit quotient. Notice that this B is a y vector. It's not the usual unit vector that we had before. So let's first look at the action of Q on the B perpendicular. So the plane that's perpendicular to the B of the y vector. Now the B perpendicular is spanned by O and B O. Why? Because your basis vectors in B are 1 and B. If you apply the duality operator, you get basically the vectors that are perpendicular. So both O and B O are actually perpendicular to every vector in the plane of B. And you also know that this is a unit vector, so B squared is equal to minus 1. Now, you can see that the plane of 1 and the y vector B is looking like your complex plane. If you consider a point in the B perpendicular, given by, let's say, cosine phi O, cosine phi B O, so O and B O are the basis vectors in the B perpendicular, we can write this in the following fashion. So your Q is a unit vector, and you have your O is the duality operator on the right hand side. And we want to multiply this P, which is the operand, with a Q, a quaternion that's given by your word here. So if you multiply these two, basically you get this. So what you see is that the P has been now rotated by an angle theta in the dual plane. That's what happens to the Q in the plane perpendicular to B. What about in the parallel plane of B? So what is the action of Q on parallel plane of B? Well, we have a vector V, let's say, which is in the plane represented by B. We know that B parallel is spanned by B and BB, which we can show that this is parallel to this plane. We again multiply them. So we have the quaternion, we have the V, which we are trying to transform. And we get a new vector in the plane of B and BB, parallel to the Y vector, which is a counterclockwise version by B. If you multiply V on the left hand side, you actually get a negative sign. So that's a clockwise rotation. So you can see that things are very, very similar to what we had for the quaternions. We had two mutually orthogonal planes, and in one of the planes, the left quantification, right quantification were doing the same thing, counterclockwise rotation. And in another plane, the quantification was doing one direction rotation, one direction rotation. And this is just the left and right quantification we've talked about. But what we really want to talk about is the commutation function because that is our connection to the 3D rotation we discussed before. <coughs> so what about the commutation function? Well, commutation function is this, Q, V, V, Q, Q, V, Q star, right? So Q is your y vector, V is your vector, and Q conjugate is your y vector. So what we would like to do is now see what happens to the vector V when you have two quaternions, one, which is the conjugate of the other one, sandwiching B. Okay, now there are two ways you can go about doing it. One is that if you can write your vector V, you write the B, and work out the algebra and see that this is going to give you a 3D rotation. The other is that you can make the geometry of R. Okay. All right, so 
Uh, this was my last slide. I'm going to end here. I'm going to have to take any questions. <coughs> yes? Uh, what is the benefit of Clipper algebra over Cotton? And what can we do with it that we couldn't do with Cotton? And why did we do it? If we were just going to do quaternions, sure, there are simple tools we can use them. But this is showing you the method of formalism that exists that tries to create more numbers, different numbers, <laughs> uh, just launch the quaternions. So you can see that this language of quaternion, and, and I didn't talk about the dual quaternions, how they get to the Clifford algebra, but they all actually fall within the space of Clifford algebra. The other main advantage it was in the description like we saw in R2 and R3. Clifford of R2 allows you to split the operator and the operator separately. That is something you don't have in the complex plane or in the autonomous. When we use uh, quaternion like Euler parameters in kinematics, we don't see any singularity that's the benefit of uh, Euler parameters in quaternion. Uh, do we have the same property in Clifford algebra but in terms of singularity? We have, the same, we have all the properties that you have for the quaternions that you see for you know, regular quaternions with, without invoking any mention of any mention to a different algebra, plus some more. So yes, you do get all of those benefits. Um, in terms of computational benefits, does Clifford algebra give some kind of competitive edge over algebra? Because what I'm seeing is like for R2 space, it's like four dimension. For, for each dimension, it exponentially increases. So I'm thinking, so the question is, does it offer any computational uh, advantage? Yeah. Possibly not, because now you have to do more computation. Yeah. There's, no, there's no doubt about that. But you're getting this uh, <coughs> representation, which is more robust. The computation will be more robust, as well as uh, it's far more general. If we wanted to extend this to dual quaternions or any other kind of algebra, we would have to invoke the paper algebra. Having said that, if you were just doing the transformations, you know, you would probably live without learning anything about paper algebra. Like I did for a very long time. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the advantage of using Clifford algebra over Cotton? Does it offer constraints that you can exploit uh, for doing, for checking your computations, for example? Like, I'm thinking maybe uh, the unit vector constraint unit quaternion constraint for rotation. Is, are there things like that in the Clifford algebra that you can exploit? Actually, it is not really a constraint. If you, even if you didn't mention or talk anything about paper algebra, <coughs> you really don't need unit quaternions to do three rotation. You can do, because if you use them as homogeneous coordinates, they could be non-unit quaternions. And you would not have to actually normalize them, except when you're doing the display on the computer screen. Because we can treat the quaternions as homogeneous quarters. Computer graphics community has believed for a very long time that quaternions need to be unit, but actually they don't need to be. If you remember uh, the slide where I had the mapping between the quaternion components and the rotation matrix, we had the right over here. So we have this S squared term over here in the denomination. So if you multiply any quaternion by any scalar number, any number, any scalar quantity, actually it cancels out. So it doesn't even have to be in a quaternion yet. Maybe you can clarify my question. I think I was wondering if the unit quart unity constraint for a unit quaternion is very really useful in reprojecting any, like if you're doing a lot of quaternion computations, you could potentially <coughs> have a violation of the constraint. And then you project back onto the hypersphere. Right. So, and you know that because you have the, you have the requirement that it has to be a unit quaternion. Yeah. Are there rules like that that you can exploit from a Clifford algebra perspective that allow you to use geometric insight in, in, in making sure that computationally you don't drift I don't know if Clifford uh, algebra is going to be an advantage over quaternions in that sense. Uh, because the same quaternions are embedded in Clifford algebra. 
I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe somebody else will hear those. Mike? Uh, I have to say, I'm right. this has really been interesting. <laughs> yeah, because I've never really looked at the, the formulation, the, the way you're going after the Clifford algorithm stuff. I've always used the Clifford algorithm just as a sort of a foundation to unite what seem to be very different things. You know, you think you've got dual paternity, you know, where does this funny number come from? Right. You square it and it becomes zero. And then you look in a, a paper and you see that the guy who invented it said, well, you could square it and make it one, one yes. or you could square it and make it minus, minus one. one. You could make it, and you go, where's all this coming from? And that's what the Clifford algebra did for me. It helped sort it out all of that into sort of a primitive structure. But you've gone even further. You've really created some nice uh, geometric interpretation of one well, operation. It's, it's not original. I've read it. Oh, no, I know, but yeah. I, it's, it's nice. Yeah. But I think the question Mike was asking, which I'm not able to answer right now, is does Clifford algebra offer any advantage over the regular function in the way we have reinforced constraints? Well, I would say that the Clifford algebra formulation provides you maybe a very rich and maybe in some ways too rich a way of looking at uh, the link between geometry and linear algebra. Because these physicists just go crazy with You've seen it with the um, geometric algebra community, but you also see it in you know, all these guys doing you know, string theory and all this stuff, which is all built on Clifford algebra also. So it, it gets, all of a sudden for me, I become very comfortable going back to old school quaternions and dual quaternions, because that's enough for me. You know? But the fact that it is probably a very easy and very uh, convenient uh, practical representation of Good. Okay. Um, I, I usually don't go too much further than that. I say, I say. Uh, you mentioned infinity and kind of making things more robust. Can you elaborate a little bit on how? Um, yeah. So, if we, from? so if you go here to the homogeneous coordinates, uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, an extra factor over here. Right? So if you start with the on coordinate. And you add an extra dimension over here, you want to find by state of quantity, you have something like this over here. So if this is non zero, when you project it, which is basically a division, you'll get a finite number. So it's a point in the finite space. Okay. If that lambda happens to be zero, you will get the point as an infinity. But you don't have to do the division. Because you have the extra coordinate. Because you have the extra coordinate. Okay. So that, yeah, so this last coordinate is sort of signature as to whether it's a finite point or whether it is a vector or a point at infinity. I think we're at a great point. So let's take a break and come back in 10 minutes and start into the next session. And that session will go till five minutes till noon, approximately. Thank you.